made us holy. He made us righteous. And he walked with us. And you love us. And when we fall, you pick us up. And you dust us off. And just say, walk with me, child. Just walk with me. Oh, you're so good. You are so good. And we honor you. And we praise you, our Savior and our King, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Beautiful praise unto the Lord this morning. Always thank you. Thank you, voices. It's good to hear your voices. Sing unto the Lord. It's beautiful. One day, when everything comes together and we meet him in the air, oh boy, he'll be running. It'll be good, so... This morning we're going to keep on, hey, we made it out of chapter one, you know, in our study in Luke, that took uh, a few months, but uh, we're going to keep on going, we're going to keep pressing on. We're going to do the Christmas story in July today, go to Luke chapter number two, Luke chapter number two. All of you that have been in investors, you you heard of one side of the story, we're going to give you the beginning side, we're not going to be as radically crazy at Armageddon today. We're going to go to the birth of Jesus. We're going to go just nice, a little bit easy, you know. But uh, keep in mind that our youth group, Primed Summer Camp, is finishing up this morning. They're on their way back here pretty soon. Uh, there wasn't as many teenage parents in first service. Maybe they were sleeping in, getting ready for their kids to get back. I don't blame them. Um, if you are really nice to Josh, you can ask him to keep them for a few extra hours. But uh, no, I think you all want them back. So uh, I had a chance to be down there for some team building on Thursday and Friday uh, with the junior high and then with the high school. Had a wonderful time. And uh, I can stay from <clears throat> on the middle of the woods with all the, all the creatures that like to get on you and bite you and all that kind of stuff. We, we had a really good time just uh, building up the team. And they responded to the Lord. It was wonderful and very thankful for the time and the opportunity to do that. And and again, Mighty Mites was a wonderful time yesterday. Uh, men's softball, someday we're going to play again. I think we can play today. We'll figure it out. We'll just play in the mud and we'll figure it out. But there's a lot of neat things in our place in July. As much as we have the family gathering on Sundays to get, you know, charged up a little bit, come together in the spirit of God, uh, the temple of God. We are the house of God and we understand together the living temple that's at work that You are the house that holds God because you're born again, new creature in Christ. Old things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The greatest new thing that happened is you had new life spiritually and you became alive. And of course, you are the vessel that houses the God of the universe, believer. You can't forget that. As we looked at Mary a few weeks ago, she would be looked at as being this incredible vessel that God set apart She's not anyone special ahead of time other than God chose her to do an assignment. And she was, as it says in Scripture, blessed among women. And she really was the high priest's growing place physically, as we know Jesus is eternal in his deity. But humanly speaking, here here he is, the high priest for us, the chief shepherd for us who, of course, is growing in Mary's belly as we left our study in Luke chapter number one. And again, thinking about everything that we've gotten into over the last few weeks in this study, we want to point to the idea that we need to make the hope of Jesus Christ known to people, make hope known. Yesterday, I listened to Big Raj. That was a great illustration, a great story of uh, when you were a little child. And you came to the realization that, hey, some people were better than you. Some kids, some players, I was listening to you. What a great story. Our break time was about community and having to realize that just because you're comparing yourself and contrasting yourself to the, the players because of their physical abilities doesn't mean you can't be part of the team in the community, in the Lord, in Jesus Christ, and really see God work in the whole team. And by the way, you guys are awesome yesterday, you and your son being out there. It was just a great time to see community at work. Well, 
it only comes off of Jesus Christ. It only comes off of this baby, Jesus, that God ordained and anointed to come through the womb of Mary. Babies change a lot of things, don't they? Babies have a way of changing everything in your life. And I know a lot of you um, look forward maybe to that day when you'll have babies. Other you might say, I don't know. But many of you have had little babies, and they all grew up. Don't you like when they're like this tiny? They're perfect. But when you think about a baby real quick, let me just get your help for me because this is where we're headed today off of the Christmas story to make a personal application to it. Babies do change everything. And any of you that have had babies or, of course, grandchildren, they're like, they're way over the top. They don't change the same kind of things. They change things for the good. But tell me something. Throw up your hand. What is something that changed in your life when you had your little baby? Anybody? Yes. <laughs> or lack of? Yes. Sleep. All the moms are going to say, no sleep anymore. Yes. Priorities. They do change, don't they? Yes. Responsibilities now are all brand new. Anybody else? They do make you a better person. But you've got to track into the Lord to have him make you that. What else? Babies change everything. Ooh, they help you discover how much you can love them like the Father loves us. Isn't it beautiful? Yes, responsibility. What else? Oh, mom's body. Everything changes in a mother. Even more so, you moms know things and understand things that we can't even track, can't even come close to. You see, Jesus Christ is about to change the whole world. But in this little setting here, just track back again historically, Zechariah has just sung of John, and he, John's come and he's sung of him, his dedication, his benediction. We know of how Mary sung the magnificent, the, the song of Jesus going, God's going to be, God is magnificent, and he's the magnificent, and she's singing while she's with Elizabeth visiting, and how their visit was a neat visit that turned into a time of worshiping the Lord. But now here we are. We're here at the place where you've read this story, probably in this passage of Scripture. You've read this or had it read to you more than any other, the first 20 verses of Luke chapter number two. And so we're going to break it down just to three or four little pieces and parts and look at how this baby changed everything for them and then how a baby changes everything for us. Even someone else's baby in the body of Christ, in our local church, in our place where someone else, someone's having a baby, hey, we're going to do something for you. How can we be alongside of you? How can we be there for you? We want to be there if we can for you. And you understand something incredible, like so many of you said, about responsibility and changes and how you learn to love. You have to track into God and understand that there's so much that's changing in your life. It says up on the screen this very simply. Chapter 2 is read this way. And if it's not up on the screen, then don't worry about it because I can still speak that way. Who's up there? Who's up on the screen? Who's up there? Who's... What did you guys do? Break everything up there? But guess what? If you can fix it then, woo, way to go. So chapter 2 is read as a Christmas story, but also it's taught. Taught through in deep theological ways of so much that's going on here. And it's taught as one of the most significant events in world history. And of course, I'm going to walk through bits and pieces of it and both sides of it, but not get incredibly deep on either side. I want to really see where God will take us, of course, with personal application. After our breakdown already that we've had of Gabriel visiting, of Mary's visit with Elizabeth, of Mary's song, as I mentioned earlier, of Zecharias and his song and, and how his incredible accolades toward God of the birth of his son. Here we are just saying, okay. It's just a Christmas story. 
I ask you just to stop anticipating already what could happen in our next 30, 40 minutes. Oh, I know that we're going to have a message, and I know the text, and so many of us know about verse number 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, and maybe that's the, the Christmas card that you use. But I want you to consider a few historical things, a few of the doctrinal pieces, and then as we make, as I said, a personal application, you go, wow, there's a lot here that hits every one of us when it comes to the idea that a baby changes everything. You see, Isaiah prophesied about the birth of Christ. Micah prophesied where Christ would be born. The prophets proclaimed everything they proclaimed. They've been silent for 400 years, and then we know that as we look back and say, wow, everything is going to be fulfilled. He then said that there's going to be a place where that baby has to be born. The king, the one that's going to rule in Israel, has to be born in this place called Bethlehem. See, every 14 years, the taxation was set up on the earth, but God prophesied that somehow, some way, Jesus was going to be born. Somehow, some way, man thinks that they are orchestrating things when God is actually the one orchestrating everything. In fact, let's be reminded, Isaiah chapter number 7, it says, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? You may wear the people of Israel out a little bit, but truly you cannot weary God, although you try. He says to Israel, prophet Isaiah, Therefore, in verse number 14, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We already know ahead of time that it's all prophesied. He is going to be the ruler in Israel. He's going to be of the house of David. It says in Micah 5, 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, thou, though thou be a little among thousands of Judah, just a tiny little town, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old from everlasting. He is eternal, and yet he is also human. The location is set forth by God. What he's going to be and who he's going to be is set forth by God. He's come, come from the tribe of Judah, the house of David. We all know this. His name is going to be Emmanuel, God with us, so as it's been prophesied, and you're reading out the Christmas story or this incredible narrative that Luke puts forth, you realize he's narrating God's holy word, of course. And we, you know, we've said it, it's, it's really a good possibility that he had to look to the witnesses and interview the people that were around this in order to get the details of which he could write it down. In fact, Luke narrates the events of Jesus' birth with powerful insight. We know this. We have God's account. This is God's account of the birth of his own son. We say, okay, yeah, yeah, I got that. I got that. I got that. We'll be reminded again in real time of Mary and how she was confronted, how Elizabeth was confronted, Zacharias, Joseph, and everything. The angel Gabriel said unto her, verse number 30 of chapter number 1, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Of course, verse number 32 through 33, He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Is that as a backdrop? Consider again what happened to old Mary. What happened to Mary and Joseph? Again, personally speaking, because sometimes we just kind of scan over the top of it. Gabriel told Mary she would give birth to the Messiah. And these regular people with regular lives were changed forever. Maybe a lot of you moms can dig into this a little deeper today, but all of us that have had children, that have children, that have watched this incredible miracle happen in our own lives or in the lives of other people, step back and go, these are just two regular people like you and me. Mary and Joseph, and God said, I'm going to interrupt your life. I'm going to intervene in your life. I am going to do something that will change everything in your personal life. Of course, we know Jesus Christ changed the world. 
Simple. I've mentioned it a couple times, even with just asking a question. Babies change everything. Not a tough idea, a tough thought, but that's going to be our approach today. Say, well, how are you going to look at a familiar passage of Scripture for everybody? This is the way God's going to lead us to go. So jump in with me. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 and put a thought before you. Then read verses 8 through 14, put a thought before you. And let's see how this personally applies to our lives as we think about how babies do change everything. We talked about it already. You already gave me some great illustrations, some great great answers, some great things. And maybe I'll even read you uh, a couple of little articles that say some things about how parents' lives are changed with the arrival of a little baby. Let's dig in. Verse number one, chapter number two. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Remember that this man, he ruled for about 40 years at the time, around 25, 27 B.C. until 14 A.D. He was an adoptive son of Caesar, and he took his name, Augustus, so that he, of course, as being a ruler, had this power to do such things. It says in verse number two, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. Very simply, every 14 years, historically speaking, the Roman Empire had this set in place that there would be a tax. Kind of like what we love to get those reassessment letters, as I've mentioned before. Don't you love that? Isn't our... Our county, so oh, they love us so much. And now your hundred thousand dollar house is worth three million dollars. Aren't you glad? But again, I just say that jokingly, yes. But here, think about them. Tax is a burden. It's a levy. It wasn't God's way for things to be done. The taxes were done in small principle for reasons. But this tax here was, of course, for those that were the ruling powers of the day. The burden, yes, but God instrumentally used that burden of tax going back to orchestrate his prophecy, which again goes back to God can supersede any of this stuff. We just need to allow him to do it. Pick it up in verse number four. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now you're familiar so much with these verses. Just look at that verse number seven, just to get a little historical backdrop before we put up our first lesson point. Firstborn, we know that to be true. She's espoused to Joseph, yes, but she has not been with him. So their marriage, their betrothed to one another by families that have made this arrangement in the culture of the Jew, they know that they are going to be together, but of course, she has a little baby that's now nine months and ready to be birthed. It is said that it's about 80 to 85 miles of a journey, nine months pregnant. How, how does that sound, girls? They didn't have a Jeep. They didn't even have a gator. Or like the people that drive through our parking lot now, a golf cart. Or maybe one of the motorbikes that go through here. Special announcement. Don't drive through the parking lot if you've got a motorbike, okay? If you're over 70, it's dangerous. Just don't do it. (laughs) But they're traveling. They get to where they have to be. The baby is brought forth. It's a firstborn son. Wrapped him in the swaddling clothes, which of course are the The garments that he was wrapped in when he was put in a borrowed tomb. Same stuff. He's put in a manger or a trough that some animal would eat out of. 
to go into the depth of that in that manger. Is so much more there. Of course, there was no room for him. It's kind of like the way that people are today. They don't have room for Jesus Christ. They put him in a manger. They put him off to the side. Maybe they'll wrap him in some clothing that would be fit for a person who is being buried. And again, just to think for a moment, Mary and Joseph in their life, they've probably been looked at a little bit difficult. They're married together, but they're not married together. She has a baby growing in her tummy. She went to visit Zechariah's house to see Elizabeth. It says she stayed there three months. We looked at that last week thinking, did she stay there? Now, the Bible doesn't say that she stayed for the birth, but you might think that she did. I'm not going to jump the Bible. That's what the Word of God says. But just keep in mind that this woman now is nine months pregnant, and she is carried or walked to Bethlehem, and now she gives birth in that whole setting. I just want to set it up because babies do change everything. And babies has a, have a way of changing things that sometimes we are not even willing to admit till they hit us, and then we realize it. So here's the first thing that happens that I see in this baby changing everything. There's a change in location. What do you mean? Well, simply put, obviously, that they made a trip. They went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So there's a physical change. But the note says up there on the screen, our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual states are altered according to God's orchestration. God orchestrates. God does things ultimately according to his will. There is, of course, the permissive will of God where he allows things to happen, but ultimately God says, my will will be done. And to be frank here, concerning Mary and Joseph, <laughs> they were assigned by God to do what God called them to do, and she could have backed out. But I don't think she could back out because the Holy Spirit of God did a miraculous thing within her womb. You see, God's will is at work here upon these parents, and baby Jesus is coming. God promised he would be a human, not an angel, that he's going to be Jewish from the tribe of Judah, that he's going to be of the family of David. It's all true, and of course he's going to be born in Bethlehem, as we said, so there's no question that all of this is the way that God would have it to be. But think about her right now. Think about Joseph right now. Think about the birth of this baby who's come into this world. What changes happen when a baby comes into your life? What happens when this new life is in your arms? Your physical location, first of all, just simply put, a personal application, your physical. What do you mean, Pastor? What are you talking about? It's altered according to God's orchestration. You may have to move. Spouse has to move, get a job somewhere else, or you have to move somewhere. Hopefully, you're not going to move away from the family support that you might have. But there is this element of change in location by, of course, physically being changed. Mentally, it says there, how is that mental location changed? Well, the mental location is changed by the mom and dad, especially the mom, for getting the proper direction in the thinking. I need to have the proper directional thinking to think what to do, where to do it. I need to make my home the way it ought to be. I need to have the right kind of thoughts because now I'm going to make a family as a mom. The emotional location has to be changed. How does it get changed? It's altered according to God's orchestration. I'm going to need to learn how to be settled down and settled in. I need that proper environment in the home I need that spiritual guidance from the Lord and from his word. I need somebody to show me how, to teach me how, to be there for me as a mom especially, but a dad and a mom as parents to say, hey, the physical, the mental, the emotional location, I have to have the proper environment, the proper directional thinking, the proper family support, and of course, spiritual location. That now that I have a little baby in my arms, a little baby that I have to raise, 
Maybe my direction, maybe my location is more upward than it ever has been in my life. That I'm not so concerned about everything in the location in which I'm sitting physically, but spiritually speaking now, I can look up to the Lord more. I can imagine how many prayers of moms there's been. They're different than us dads. I just know they are. Because you moms know stuff. You pray stuff, you care about stuff, you look up because, hey, your spiritual state has been altered according to God's orchestration that he made this holy will of his to come about. And he said, I'm going to give you a baby. And here's your baby. And that's what you see. Verse number six says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And God orchestrated everything, not just in the physical, but now, as she brought forth her firstborn, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn, she makes it sweet and right and good in that environment that had to be rough if it was a place where the animals were kept. The change in location, to me, would be the first thing that we see in how the baby changes everything. And what do I do with that? As a parent, as a believer, I need to lock into the Lord to have him, by his orchestration, walk me through the right way to have my location physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally more geared to this baby and to this family that God has given us. The second thing I want you to see is found in verses 8 through 14. Follow along with me. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of God, the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. What an incredible setting. There's the angel of the Lord, there's shepherds being visited. The angel said unto them, Fear not. Sounds like a common statement here. Don't be fearful, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. You know what I see here is that in how the baby changes everything, there's a change in attention. First it was the change in location. Now it's the change in attention. Now, from heaven above, the attention is to glory. The angel of the Lord, the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The shepherds are in the field caring for the sheep. You wonder if those sheep are the sacrifices that are going to be presented one day for the one that they're going to go visit this day. You wonder about those shepherds and how, who they are and how the angel of the Lord and the heavenly host and this incredible scene that I know many of you have thought about, but maybe many of you haven't thought about the change in attention because there's an attention shift. The attention now is to glory. The attention now is to God. The attention is to the statement and the proclamation and the praise of God being praised. And they're saying glory to God. They're giving God glory and the highest peace Goodwill toward men. Who gets the attention now? Mary's had the attention. Joseph's had the attention. The baby is born. Now the little baby has attention there. But out in the field, who has the attention? It's all been changed. It's God who has attention now. And he's bringing attention to himself. And he has every right to do so. We ought to attend to that. We ought to be attentive to God. We look and we read and we go, oh, that was a nice story. That's nice. Let's move on out of this and go into something deeper. This is as deep as it gets. It's an event that changed the history of mankind. There's nothing that happened like this since the creation. Think about it. God has not intervened into his creation since he made his creation. Think about it. God came to this earth. 
See, the attention changes because the baby changes everything. The personality, the friends, the priorities, the interactions are altered according to God's manifestation. He's manifested himself. Now, practically speaking, personally speaking, think about it. Those of you who have held a baby, those of you who have given birth to a baby, those of you who are parents, those of you who have never, but you've held other people's babies, you look at that baby and go, oh, boy, God, you are incredible. That you can manifest yourself in seven pounds, five ounces. All the women out there are going, oh, the pain, the agony. Us boys, we're sissies, but we get a chance to hold the little baby. The manifestation of his glory, the manifestation of the attention that's given upward. You see, all those shepherds have been concerned about as a sheep, and now they're being visited by the angel of the Lord, and the visit is going into the place of the heavenly host that are singing and praising God. So what happens, practically speaking, is my personality is now lost in God manifesting a miracle. As a parent, your personality just got completely altered by God's manifestation. Your friends are now a little different, and the ones that maybe you had before are different because now you need the family friends of your church more than ever. When our hospitality ministry knocks on your door and says, I just want to bring you a meal, I want to come in and pray with you, I want to pray for you, I want to do anything I can for you. And all of a sudden you see the manifestation of new friends in Jesus Christ and you're going, no way, because that's how God manifests himself in the body of Christ, through the baby. And you go, wow, this is really cool. Priorities now. They're changed. Somebody mentioned that in just me interacting with you a little while ago. Your priorities are now, hey, God, I know that now they're altered according to your manifestation. And they're looked at through this little miracle. I can't do that anymore, and I can't do that anymore. I look at this little thing, and I, what am I going to do? Ah! So now my priorities are completely different. Joseph and Mary know this. This miracle appeared, and now I get no sleep. My health is destroyed, and I'm trying to get him on a schedule, and he just will not cooperate. I hear boys are worse than girls, but the girls are good, aren't they? We take the girls. The girls are okay. I saw the youth summer camp speaker, Jeff Grasher, down at camp, down there for a little bit. And I said, hey, I heard, congratulations, you had like your 14th child. No, he just, he's like pregnant every year that they have a camp, and he asks him to speak. He just had his fourth daughter. He's caught you. There you go. Go girls. Go girls. What's it like having those granddaughters there, Doc and Bobby? Go girls. But here you have the interactions that are determined by the needy little baby attention sucker. Not just at the pack of yum, 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 but they suck attention from you, don't they? They're, ba they're attention suckers. So now there's a change in attention. They need you all the time. Cheryl and I tell this story. I'm sure many parents have done this one. You go in and check on your baby at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Why? Because you haven't been sleeping because you don't know if the baby's okay. Now they got these monitor things and they make noises and stuff. I'm going, they got the, the noise machines. It sounds like Orca the Whale's in there. And I don't know. You got all kinds of fun stuff now. We go over there and Victoria, our firstborn, she being there, like zonked out. You know, you know is she okay? Is she okay? And then you put your finger back in the... Ah, oh, she's breathing. Yes! Everything's okay! They have your attention. Because of God's manifestation of a miracle. This is the miracle of Jesus. And the attention's on glory right now. The attention's on God. You are glorious. 
You are worthy of all praise. Third thing, let's pick it up. Verse number 15 through 20. And it came to pass as the angels were gone from them into the heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even into Bethlehem and see that, see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered all those things which were told by them, excuse me, told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Oh my what a beautiful little setting for this one. They're sitting there. They don't know that the shepherds have had a visit. They don't know that the sheep have been singing. <laughs> well, that was, that's me. But they've been out there singing praises to God. It's been a glorious time. And now, beyond the fact that God's changed the location and changed the attention with this baby that changes everything, now there's a change in identification. See, it says up there, change in identification. Our position, our purpose, our relationships, our heritage are now altered according to God's beautification. See, it's not that he just manifested anything. It's that God is a God of beauty. God makes things so beautiful. And this is a beautiful setting. Would it behoove us that maybe more of us would be shepherd-like people? Moms. You're like shepherds. You care for this little baby when it stinks, when it is in need of attention. In this setting where the location's a little goofy, the attention is on God and his glory. And now we bring this idea of the identification of mom and dad and who they are. This is a time when Mary, Mary, Mary was highly favored. The Lord is with thee, blessed among women. She's a virgin. She's a spouse to Joseph. And yet, her identity is completely altered. Because now she's the mother of the Most High God. She wasn't before he was born, but now she is. And the shepherds are coming not to say anything to Mary. They found Mary, they found Joseph, they found the baby in the manger, and they didn't pay attention to her, as it says. It says when they seen it, they known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child, and all they that heard it wondered all the things which were told them by the shepherds, and Mary's there going, I'm going to ponder this. I'm just going to ponder these things. That's the beauty of a mom. The beauty of a mom that can just ponder. Because she knows her identity is still found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And her identity, yes, is found in her husband and in that baby. But she may be lost in all of it all. Because they didn't come to see her and pat her on the back. They didn't come to Joseph. They came to see the Most High King. There's a change in identification when the baby comes. There's a change in your position. Our position, our purpose, our relationships, our heritage are altered according to God's beautification. That's how this identification, because this is all, was all Mary, and now it's all Jesus. And it's always going to be all Jesus. And Mary just pondered these things in her heart, and whatever that may mean, I just simply look at it and think, she has no problem being who she is right now. As a parent, my identification has a new position. I may have been a wife, a husband. I may have just been a good hard worker at the house, but now I'm a dad, I'm a mother. You see, that lowly shepherd is about one tiny level regarded in the Jewish culture above a leper. If you study the way that the shepherds were treated, and there's enough accounting of that and studying the Word of God where they were always looked at as being the lowly, dirty, set aside and dismissed people. And yet God used the shepherds to come and to be the first visitors at the manger. And now we understand even more so the identity that is found in the position that Mary and Joseph have. They're just mom and dad. 
And they need that Savior right there, just like the shepherds need that Savior right there. And they're no different. Now they're in the place where all of us were, or maybe you are today. There is none righteous, no, not one. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And these shepherds, they're beginning to grasp it. This is the most high king and the Messiah. And if you've never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, baby Jesus is fine, but the death, burial, and resurrection of the risen Savior, that's who you need to believe in. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the Christ. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. And everything that you're thinking about and the identity of who you are because you gave birth to a baby is awesome. But there's nothing like this one right here. And you and I wonder how some religious approaches could twist this up and put such an importance on someone other than Jesus Christ, that's just part of what man does. The shepherds put the attention on Jesus and then they went out and they were these incredible evangelists. It would behoove us again, as I mentioned, that we would have more shepherds around. More shepherds. We could use more shepherds. Moms, you're the best shepherds I know. You are. I'm thankful. I only had my mom for a short time, man. She died at a young age. But boy, I'm thankful. She taught me the things of religiousness that led me to have a desire for God. And I couldn't get saved by the way that she showed me, but I truly am thankful for how she pointed me to God and that one day I came to know Jesus Christ 40 years ago. And then I had an opportunity to go lead her to Jesus myself. Moms, you shepherd. And you got to keep on shepherding because your identification has a new position and a new purpose. You think about the purpose that Mary had now. I bet she didn't ponder like she pondered now because your new purpose is to ponder. Think of the things of God. My identification, your identification when that baby changes everything means you have different relationships. You might now hang out with other moms. Now, I don't suggest that you go visit with another mom and talk about how much your baby cries versus how much theirs cries. Though it might be a cool conversation. I'm able to stop mine crying better than you. I use the pacifier. I use the sound machine. I leave the room when they're crying and don't come back. <laughs> Grandpas can do that, you see. But you find another mom. It's in the Bible that moms that are older would minister to the younger moms. Young moms, go ask an older mom how to do this thing. Because Paul taught it, Peter taught it, and that's where we can get this strengthening in different relationships. And the last one is your heritage. Maybe the heritage is just tied together with you and your husband, you and your wife. Maybe it was just tied together to all of your brothers and sisters. And now you have a child. Now you're thinking, wow, what's our heritage going to be like? Is he going to be a preacher someday? Maybe he'll be a pastor. Maybe she will marry a guy that just loves her and loves God and serves in the community giving the gospel to people. Maybe a husband and wife, one day my children would grow up and they would, they would go to the mission field together or maybe serve in ministry together. You see, change in identification. The babies change everything. And it altered everything according to how his beauty works. God makes things beautiful. He shapes and molds and makes things beautiful if we would just let him according to his word, according to his son, Jesus Christ. Last thing. It fits here with this, even though I know this leads to the next part of the story of Jesus and the story of what happens in their meeting when they meet Simeon. But grab 21 through 24. There's one more thing in these parents' life that the baby changes. Verse 21. 
And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. You've got two pieces here, the circumcision of the boy, eight days old, and then you have the purification of the woman, 40 days, according to the law of Moses. Correct? It says there as it continues, verse number 23, as is it written in the law of the Lord, Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There's been a change in identification, a change in attention. There's been a change by this baby in the location of life. And now lastly, there's a change in obligation. The obligation. The simple meaning of the word obligation, the binding power of a vow, a promise, or a contract. They have a contract with the law of Moses. Back in Genesis 17, remember we talked about this with John being circumcised. It was precious and powerful of God with the covenant with Abraham that the nation of Israel, in order to identify them as all males would be set apart And this would be a symbol, a sign of the covenant with God, with them, and them with God, that they belong to the Lord, that they would be circumcised. Mary and Joseph know the law. They know the book of the word. They know the book of the law. They understand from the law of Moses what they're supposed to be doing. In Leviticus, it talks about the purification of a woman. It still comes down to the law of Moses in the first five books. You see, there's a change in the obligation. Because our obedience, our sacrifice, our choices, and our preferences are altered according to God's inspiration. Here's God's inspiration. So they're altered by what God said in his word. At this point in their lives, they have Moses' law. They understand this enough. We have the whole complete Bible as God would have us to have it. They understand about circumcision, as I mentioned earlier. They, meant they, they understood about purification. So in this point in their lives, as these two people are walking out this new life with this new baby, they recognize that they need to fulfill the obligation unto the Lord, and they do so. Now, personally speaking, for us today, personal application. We have an obligation as believers to know what the Word of God says in obedience as parents. If you and I as parents aren't obedient unto the Lord and see that as being really important, then how can we possibly teach children well in the place of obedience? We want to teach our children obedience Correct? Yes? But if I'm not obedient to the Lord, my children are going to see right through me. And they did. They found every single place where I was doing the thing that we said we wouldn't do. Do as I say, not as I do. That took a lot of work with me before the Lord to say, Lord, now you do the work before me that I would repent of things in my life like doing my own thing when I would teach my children, I want you to do what your mother says, but then I'd go off and do what I would want to do, a contrary to the Word of God. You say that's just something simple and it's not a big deal. When you build up an equity of sin and disobedience in your life as a parent, it will be reflected in the way that our children are going to be. You say, is that the only reason why they're disobedient? No. But in my own personal life, I need to take care of what I need to be as a parent, which is to change my obligation unto the Lord to make it even deeper according to his word because the word of God talks a lot about raising children and how to raise them well. So why why wouldn't I go find that out? I think it's probably pretty important. So there'd be a change. 
Our obedience has to be altered according to God's inspiration. Our sacrifice, my sacrifice, I need to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. They came in and brought their Old Testament sacrifice knowing that they were fulfilling what God said they were supposed to do. But all this is is according to the Mosaic law. They're bringing an offering, it says there, Turtle doves is a sacrifice. It was an evidence of how little they had, but they brought that. Five pence may be worth of a sacrifice. They're bringing a sacrifice to redeem their son, who happens to be the redeemer that's going to redeem everybody with his blood. Hmm. But they were fulfilling what God commanded them to do. They were doing what was right, being in a place of making sacrifice. But we know the word of God teaches us through the life of David. If God wanted the sacrifice and offering, he would do it. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. It says, thou will not despise. You see, obedience and sacrifice. I need to sacrifice for my children. I need to be dedicated unto the Lord. I need to have him alter things in my life according (coughs) to his perfect word and his inspiration. And it says up there, choices and preferences. You don't lose your free will to choose as a parent. Absolutely not. But my choices and my preferences have to be a little more aligned to the word of God as a parent because this obligation to God has now become more serious as I walk with him and I talk with him. If I want my children to learn how to pray, then I must be a person of prayer. How can I teach my children to commune with God if I don't commune with God? My choices have to be that I spend my time a little bit more wisely. Or my children will say, well, you just blow off your time and you're not around here or you're not doing this. Hey, my preferences. Well, there's nothing in the Word of God that says I can't do that. But maybe I need to alter what I prefer in order to look at things and say, wow, I have this obligation to raise my babies, to raise my children who now are all grown and it's still important. Because we may have grandchildren one day. And again, the obligation simply means I have a duty to the Lord. Scripturally, morally, to dig in for the kids. You see, there's a change in obligation. There's a change in identification. There's a change in our attention and how we put our attention to. As God says, you need to alter your attention. And of course, there's a change in location. Babies change everything. Ultimately, Jesus Christ changes everything. That's where it comes full circle today. As you look up on the last slide here. You see, the birth of Jesus changed everything for us. Because if he wasn't born... (laughs) He couldn't go to the cross. The birth of Jesus changed everything for us. It changed everything for Mary. It changed everything for Joseph. So is the Savior, the Christ, the Lord. Believers, still changing things in your life today. And those of you who may not be a believer today, maybe you'd consider allowing him to change your life forever. When you call on the name of the Lord to save you. And he will give you a life change like no other. One thing to have a baby and have them change your life. It's another thing when the divine savior of the world comes into your life, forgives you, and gives you eternal life forever and ever. Amen. Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer as we go into our time of invitation and prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for our time and your word. It's so sweet to open up your word, and I know it's often said that this is the Christmas story in Luke 2, but thank you for leading us and directing us down this road and letting us see and hear and understand from your word how this baby Jesus changed, changed everything. And that you, Jesus, now at the right hand of the Father, you are the life changer. You are the life that's made new. I pray for this time of prayer. 
this time of invitation, this time where my brothers and sisters can just really do business with you. I pray that we can answer the question properly. And if there's a why not, maybe today is a time where we say, Jesus, I want you to be a little more of the Lord that you're supposed to be in my life. I know you're my Savior, but I know that I need you to change me more every day. God, do a work in our people. Do a work in everyone's heart. Do a work in my heart at the end of this message. In this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Please stand.